Awesome. Thank you very much, Avery. So look, wherever you are in the world uh, tuning in, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, my name is Mark Buchan, and I welcome you to the business focus track of this Transcending the Crisis event. I don't know about you if you've been tuned into the last previous session, but my mind's a bit buzzing after all the stuff and the conversations that are going on. And I you can maybe see I was a bit active in the, uh, in the chat there, but, um, but I'm not going to dwell on that so much more. So look, um, what's this business track about? Well, just very briefly, business has the power to do such good in the world. Yeah, and as such, the organizations who engage in whatever their business is. But yeah, our experience and research over the years would suggest that a lot of business and many of the organizations you know, carrying out that business are, are somewhat killing our planet. And as many of you will no doubt agree, it's time for a change. And it's time for a new set of paradigms around business leadership and organizations. So today's speakers that I'm gonna be chatting to are offering us their perspectives, guidance and insight into how they can bring about this change. And I'm gonna be starting by talking to Bill Joyner who will share with us some perspectives about utilizing his model of leadership agility. I'll then go on to talk to Professor Tony Bendel, who will discuss uh, distinctions around anti-fragile organizations and how they can contribute to new paradigm. After that, I'll be speaking to David Cushman, who will give us some insights into how a responsible organization can help in times of crisis. And last but by no means least, I'll be talking with Jeremy Denisti, who will be discussing perspectives that he can offer on the adaptive resilient organization. Um, so just let you know as well that we will keep a few minutes at the end of these, these sessions for some questions. However, if we do go over, because I mean, my chats with Bill sometimes I, they tend to go on because I find them deeply interesting. So, so we may or may not have time for it. But if you do put your uh, questions out there, we'll get round to answering maybe shortly after the event. So very briefly, just a short intro about me. I'm Mark Bucket, Managing Director of the Agile Leader. Author of Leaders, it's not how you finish, it's how you start. I'm a leadership and culture uh, specialist. I was going to say expert there, specialist is better. <laughs> Executive coach consultant with over 20 years experience, helping organizations become more agile and troubleshooting, uh, troubleshooting agile transformations. I now train and develop aspiring agile leaders in leadership. You can find out more information about me and the other speakers today under the contributor section of the Transcending the Crisis website. So that's enough about me. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Bill Joyner. Bill is one of my favorite authors uh, and uh, his uh, book on leadership agility is, is one that I read way back in t t uh, 2011 and I was inspired by it from, from the get-go. I recommend this book to all coaches and leaders who want to help uh, themselves and their clients advance and involve their agile mindset. Um, Bill has literally decades in the field of leadership uh, team and organizational agility. Bill, or maybe I should say Dr. Joyner, has a doctorate from the prestigious Harvard Business University in leadership and organizational development. Bill runs his own consultancy, ChangeWise, with his better half, Deborah, and, and I hope you don't mind saying the better half there, Bill, uh, uh, where they help leaders transform their capacity for effective action in a business environment buffeted by accelerating change and mounting complexity. So there we are, there's all my script done. Welcome, Bill. Um, good to see you today. Thanks, Mark, good to see you. Awesome, awesome. So look, um, I, I don't know how many of the listeners here already ha have an idea about um, leadership agility, the model, etc. I'm just wondering, might that be a good place for us to start you know, to, to chat a little bit about the model, why we um, have leadership agility and maybe how it can maybe help us? Yeah, I think uh, I, w I would like to share a few slides. I mean, I myself am a visual thinker and I think it's helpful to have some images the whole, the ideas we're gonna be talking about that we can just go free form after that. Um, I just wanna add about, uh, about ChangeWise. We work both with uh, leaders in their organizations and have for decades, as Mark said, but we also have uh, another side of our business where we work with coaches and we do a lot of training of coaches. We've probably trained uh, you know, 400 coaches around the world. So we have a, a wide network like that. So whether you're a leader or a coach, this might be of interest to you. Um, let, me, let me just, I'm gonna have to take a minute to s share my screen so that I can show you these slides. There we go. Awesome. All right, so. When technology works. <laughs> so basically this leadership agility model, which is based on extensive research it really looks at how personal development and leadership 
development work together. Um, so, City, you know, many of the previous uh, speakers have mentioned, you know, in one way or another, the, the big importance of the the inner, the inner side, the, the personal side of leadership um, to dealing with this crisis. Um, I just want to start by saying that there is a body of research, and I've written an article on this, linked together the research, that basically shows that uh, a company's, the level of leadership agility in the company's, what I call leadership culture, the more advanced that is, the more agile that culture is, the more agile the organization as a whole is. Not to say that's the only ingredient you need in organization ability, but it's a crucial and then it also shows that you know the more agile organizations have better business performance, uh, you know, measured in all the traditional ways that it's measured. Uh, but what is leadership agility? Well, um, I'll say a few things about this in the next couple slides. But the core practice, leadership agility, is not a switch you turn on. It's a practice that you do and you evolve. So the core practice is reflective action sort of like using a zoom as a camera. You're focused in on something, and then you're able to mentally step back from what you're focusing on and get a larger perspective, a deeper perspective of what's going on, and you use the insight that you gain from that perspective to adjust your action to meet the situation that you're in. And it's a cyclical process, so we find that the more agile the leader the uh, more frequently they do this, the more quickly they do this, and the broader and deeper perspective is that they can step back into. Um, can I interrupt you for a second, Bill? Sure, um, sure. We, we're finding it a bit difficult to hear you at the moment, so I'm just wondering if you if you might be able to speak up, or I notice when you turn your head that maybe we don't oh. catch you full on. Okay, well, let me, actually, let me try something. That would be awesome. Thank you. I didn't want to break the flow there. <coughs> I just plugged in a device that I think oh. might help. Is that, is that, that helping on the better. voice? That is much better. Can you yeah. start again okay. now, please? What is that? Can you start again? Oh, yes, great. <laughs> no, no, you're kidding, right? <laughs> I, am, I am kidding, but yeah, maybe okay. if there were some points that need clarifying, that's, I, I could just make you out. Okay. So, but yeah, but we'll, we'll see. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> So this is just a way of graphing the environment that we're in. So a lot of people talk about today, we're in a VUCA environment, right? Volatile, uncertain, complex, and um, uh, ambiguous. And of course, with the pandemic, uh, it's sort of like it's kicked in, that, even that is kicked into high gear. But I believe that the, the fundamental underlying causes of this environment that we're all talking about are two powerful global trends. One is, that the pace of change is uh, getting faster and faster. And the second is that everything is becoming more interdependent and complex. And over time, we've gone through stages in this. You know, once upon a time, these factors were low. Then let's say the last half of the last century, uh, moderate, but today it's very high, uh, unprecedented to use an overused word. So um, I'm gonna come back to this uh, chart in just a second, but basically what we found in our research and our work with leaders and organizations is that um, the more agile the leader in the organization, the more effective they are in dealing with uh, this environment. And now I'm going to put something, lay something over the, the graphics that I just showed you. These are what I call the levels of leadership agility. So what our research found is that there's a tight correlation between stages of personal development, meaning developing emotional intelligence, uh, developing more complex ways of thinking, uh, and uh, levels of leadership agility. I call it expert achiever and catalyst. And um, what this is showing on this graph is that the expert level is can be quite effective if the pace of change in and interdependence is quite low, which of course is rarely the case these days. 
The uh, achiever level can be effective in an environment where these factors are moderate. Uh, in other words, this was a leadership that worked well in the last half of the last century. But now we are facing um, you know, this unprecedented environment and it's the catalyst leaders that are the most effective and the most resilient uh, in this environment. Um, so in a way, this is like just a way of saying that the, the kind of leadership that, that brought us here is not going to get us where we need to go from here. Uh, but it's, a, it's also a way of being very specific about what, what kinds, how is the leadership different that we need in, in today's environment. So that's the, um, that's all I wanted to share in terms of slides to kind of set up our conversation. So I'm going to see if I can, Oh, I think I did it. Okay. <laughs> awesome. We're, we're back. That's excellent. Yeah. yeah. So look, Bill, I mean, th this is interesting because uh, as I've said before, I've looked at your work now for some years and, you know, I was fortunate enough to be, uh, be trained by you to do uh, uh, some of the work. And it's an interesting point, isn't it? Because in the conversations that have gone on previous, there's this talk about expertise. And I, and I made a little note earlier that, that there's already some themes from this event starting to pop. And I think you know, what your work here is, is sort of alluding to is the need for these catalyst leaders. Because an expression I've come up with now after listening to Sunil and people like that in the previous chat is about transcending expertise. Because mm -hmm. I, I think people are so bought into their expertise. So right. what, what are the sort of things yeah, that model can help with that yeah let me let me uh, put a little meat on the bones here and say just a little bit about each of these levels so we have an idea of what we're talking about it's not just labels so leaders who are operating at the the uh, expert level are tactical problem solvers hmm. and they are they tend to solve problems without much attention to the larger context around the problem or its connection to other problems um, and they, the key here is that they are identified with their expertise, whether that be technical or functional. It's like, that's me. And if you challenge my expertise, you're challenging me. Yes. Because I'm so identified with it. So I haven't transcended my expertise, to use your term. Um, and there's minimal uh, stakeholder engagement. So that's kind of a picture snapshot of the expert level. The achiever is different in that it, it sort of builds on and grows out of the expert, uh, but it's a, it's a strategic orientation and it's a, a very focused on outcomes. So that gives me, whereas the expert wants to do everything the right way, the achiever can look and say, okay, we need to get to this place down the road. How we get there isn't so, you know, I'm not so attached to how we get there as I am to that we get there. Um, Achiever leaders are realized that leadership is about not just about authority and expertise. It's about motivating people. And they're very dialed into the need to build stakeholder support. So that's the achiever leader. That's the leadership that worked pretty well in the last half of the last century. Catalyst leaders um, do something that one of the catalyst leaders I work with called aiming through the target. So what did he mean by that? He meant, the target is the strategic outcome. He needed to raise his company's share price as a CEO. Uh, he needed to raise his share, price, his share price pronto. But he said, you know, in archery and karate, they teach you to aim through the target. And what I'm aiming at through the target is to transform this organization into one that can deal with any challenge that might come along. So, you know, as we see with the pandemic, no strategic plan would have pre prepared you for this. Mm. But what, what the catalyst leaders are saying and doing is they're creating a cultures that are characterized by high levels of participation, empowerment, collaboration, straight talk, because they believe that's the kind of environment you need in your organization to be able to sense and respond to things that are coming. You can't put it in some specialized upper level department like strategic planning. So um, the, the catalyst leaders are also, they, they create these highly participative teams that sort of model the culture that they're trying to create in the organization. So they can do that, you know, they, they can bring that in a genuine and authentic way into the organization. 
And in terms of what I call pivotal conversations, meaning you've got, it, you've got differences you have to resolve, they are very good at moving back and forth between being clear and articulate about their own views and this deep listening that we were hearing about um, in the opening uh, conversation today. So that's kind of an overview of the three levels. And maybe you can kind of sense from that that there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, uh, connection between catalyst leadership and some of the kinds of things that have been discussed previously in, the, in this conference. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, so one thing that's going on in my head right now as you say this, Bill, um, is that you said that, I mean, and I don't know how accurate the figures are for these days, but because mm -hmm. I know that the research you did was still pretty years, accurate. <laughs> they're, they're still pretty accurate, right? Yeah. So, so, so if we, we're only got 10% of leaders out there that are catalysts, you know, are we rather in a bit of a corner then? Because you know, <laughs> if, if, if this is what we need right now, and if this mm -hmm. is all we've got, then... Are we not now just going to stay in the, in the same rut that we've always been in? Because I know that um, heroic leadership will come to the fore. Don't worry, I'll come and I'll save you. Get out of the way. Mm -hmm. And that's the expert, isn't it? Who wants Expert to... and achiever, the heroic levels of agility. Yeah. In, indeed. So, yeah, so if we don't do anything, if we don't do anything, then you're right. <laughs> if we begin to recognize the catalyst leadership that's taking place in our organization, uh, and it's usually in just sort of little pockets here and there because it is so few people um, and sort of reinforce and amplify that. But also, of course, and then we can think about that when we're selecting people, use that as an additional lens. You know, uh, I have a CEO client who's doing that. Uh, that's sort of part of his logic and in, in hiring people is looking at their agility level. But, you know, the big thing is developing leaders by investing in leadership development. And the, the thing is that traditional leadership development, um, the, the, there's a term that's being used for the sort of the, the stages or levels that I'm talking about, which is vertical development. Mm -hmm. And that's contrasted with horizontal development, which means you're developing new skills and competencies, but you're not changing your level of agility. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and, and that makes it hard to learn, you know, even if somebody's teaching you skills and, and behaviors that are more catalyst like if that if that training or, or education or whatever process you want to call it. Uh, if that's not also addressing the underlying cognitive and emotional capacities that you need to develop, then they're not going to stick. And we see that happen a lot. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it's a matter of. You know, we use our Leadership Agility 360 and we have a, a whole co coaching methodology for uh, facilitating this kind of vertical development. Um, so, you know, it's it, it, what we need is to sort of build on the best of leadership development that we have now, the action learning approach and all of that. Um, but pay more attention to this vertical development dimension. I think that's that's what we need to to transcend expertise and um, and deal with the crisis that we're in. But I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a bit here though, Bill, I have yeah, to say. Okay. Yeah, because is, is there not a trap there? Because if, if I hypothesize for a minute, and, and actually if I lean on my own experience in organizations, that a lot of these leaders that live at the expert level are the ones who are at the pinnacle of the organization. Mm -hmm. So when I come into an organization, I say to them, do you know what you need, guys? You need more catalyst leaders. Then it's, it's always like, well, what's one of those then? And, and I seem to invariably get all the time, yeah, people telling me, yeah, oh yeah, but, but I'm very agile. Oh, oh, that's, that's excellent. How about we measure that then? Oh, no, geez, that's the time, I must go. <laughs> so it's, yeah, the, 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 there's a bit of a trap there that people don't want to be told that they're less agile than they really are. I think it's the Dunning-Kruger bias, isn't it, that actually comes to mm -hmm. form. Is, is there a way we can sort of approach that sort of trap, you know, so as to not maybe have leaders feel so defensive about the fact that they are experts as opposed yeah. to catalysts and we need Yeah, that. great question. So a couple of things. One is that statistically, the majority, a great majority of leaders in the executive ranks are achievers. So it's not as much of a leap from ah, okay. expert to catalyst. And, and there are many um, leaders who are kind of maxed out on the achiever level. 
you know, they, they really do that. I mean, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the achiever level, they really do that well. And some even sense that there must be more to leadership than this, particularly in these times, but they're not sure what it is. So one thing is, you know, just to see what the spectrum is and what it looks like and to be able to think about, well, where am I, where do I spend most of my time? on this spectrum. And, you know, we always present this in a very non-judgmental way. It's not like you should be a catalyst mm. uh, because that just makes people defensive. As you say, it's like, here's a, here's a set of possibilities. And the whole thing about catalyst, uh, developing the catalyst, don't think of it as a, like a ladder that you climb and you get to the top and you spend all of your time at the top of the ladder. Mm. It's more like you're developing, you're, you're expanding your repertoire so that, you can, you can operate at the catalyst level whenever needed. You can also operate at the achiever level or even the expert level, depending on the situation. That's, that's another dimension of agility is to be able to calibrate like that. So it's, it's not setting up some ideal that everybody should be judged against. It's, it's more um, laying out a possibility and a roadmap and, and having a very rich description of what that catalyst leadership looks like both behaviorally, but also in terms of the uh, cognitive and emotional capacities that you're going to be developing as you, as you expand your repertoire into that dimension. That, that sounds somewhat like situational leadership in that regard, isn't it? Well, it's not the classic situational leadership model by any means. It's, I think it's much more sophisticated than that, but it is situational. I mean, it says that yeah. it's not, there's not one right way. Hmm. Um, there is, there is a set of possibilities. The, the only thing is, if you haven't developed your catalyst capacities and behaviors, you don't have the option to go there. Mm. Yes. So that's why it's so important to be able to explore this. And then in like in something like this 360 process, people just, they find out where they are. But the, the emphasis is not on, are you an achiever? Are you a catalyst? It's, like, it's more, the emphasis is more on what's the feedback? What do you want to work on? What are you moved to work and, and motivated to work on? And almost always that generates an action plan that is moving from one level of agility to another. But it's now, it, they're coming at it from the inside out. They're not coming at it as some external model that they have to, they have to live up to. Mm. Actually, that, that's such a good point, Bill. And I've just had a quick look at the uh, the questions that, that were in the, the Q&A coming up there and yep. there was a question there about um, cross silo leadership you know and how yep. um, catalyst leaders would work with that and I, I think that's actually maybe if you could give some good examples around how that would work because it's it's you know th this issue that we have isn't it just a simple one is it it's a highly complex mm -hmm. one maybe mm -hmm. chaotic even yeah, so just briefly, I mean, expert leadership generates silos. I mean, it reinforces the, you know, the organizational silos that are there because you're working on just, you, you're comfortable working with an area where you have uh, expertise and authority. Um, now, achievers are a lot better than experts in, do, in working cross-functionally. You know, they can take in different points of view. Excuse me. Um, they realize that stakeholders are really important. They, you know, they, if they're, doing a change in the organization. They look across silos and say, well, who's going to be impacted by this? We need to somehow engage those people. So that's obviously a lot more enlightened than the, the expert approach. I think the biggest difference, some of the biggest differences um, for, uh, for the catalyst are that they, let, let's put it, there's a, there's a dimension of this model uh, that I call stakeholder understanding. How deeply do you understand the stakeholder who has different, different views than you do? Um, so an achiever can pretty quickly gauge whether someone, some, a group or whatever stakeholder group or person is uh, on board to what they want to do or resistant or could care less or whatever. The catalyst really digs much deeper and they try to understand what are the pressures, the, what's the experience really like for this other person? So it's, it's one way of putting it is that it's not just putting myself in the other person's shoes, which a, a achiever can do. It's putting, it's, it's sensing what it would be like to be the other person in their shoes. Mm. That's a different thing, right? I can, I can say, oh, Mark, you went through this experience. Oh, I know exactly what that's like. 
Mm. Uh, I can put myself in your shoes, but I don't really get what it's like for you, for you from the inside out. And when you, when you have that level of understanding of where stakeholders are coming from, particularly if they have differences, it puts you in a position where you can actively explore those differences in a non-contentious way, um, which is much harder if you don't have that same capacity. Also, it's just catalysts are more collaborative. I mean, achievers are more collaborative than experts, but uh, the depth of collaboration that a, a catalyst leader can uh, generate is, is much, uh, much deeper and more, uh, makes bigger difference. So we've only got a few minutes left, Bill. This has gone sure. so frighteningly quick, but yeah. it's, it's <laughs> so, almost annoying. We should have had an hour, you know, but yeah. anyway, um, final question then, because, you know, we won't probably have a chance to take many more questions, you know, that might be right. popping up. Let's just make an assumption here that Monday morning comes round. And yeah. the, the people sitting at the pinnacle of the organization, the ones who have the power to make the most difference, what's one thing that these people can do on Monday morning that can make such a huge impact and difference to their organization so as to, if you like, transcend this crisis? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm going to choose to focus in on what I call self-leadership agility because that's what's most under your own control. Self-leadership agility is about getting feedback, being aware of your impact on others, experimenting with new behavior and getting more feedback, and so using reflective action to look at yourself and how you can improve as a leader. So, you know, one thing is to come out of this conference and say, okay, what are one or two things that I want to do differently as a leader? Or what's, what do I want to do more of? Or what's my edge? What's my growing edge as a leader? And get very clear about that. What is the behavior I want to do instead of perhaps what I'm doing now? Mm. And also, is there a mindset that I need to shift to really support that new behavior? Um, and what is that? That's a little harder to, to get to. But, um, and then to do, if you're familiar with the world of Agile, you know, in Scrum, they have these sprints where they, they do, you know, two or three work, weeks of work and then they stop and pause and get feedback. So if you think of this as a self-leadership as a series of sprints, so like Monday morning, you take uh, 10 minutes to look at what you've decided you wanna work on. You look ahead to what are the uh, opportunities I may have this week to do that, specific you know, meetings and relationships. And then uh, practice, because it is a practice. And, uh, and then at the end of the week, take 10 minutes to reflect how did that go? How do I want to adjust that? So you're doing your own kind of little mini sprint of self-leadership. And, uh, you know, and the more you can get other people involved who might be able to give you feedback on how you're doing, of course, that's all to the good. Awesome. That sounds great advice, Bill. Bill, look, I'm really sorry about this. We, we're all out of time here. And, no worries. Um, but, but again, there's some questions coming up, so maybe we'll get, get to answer some of those offline, and maybe we get a chance to chat again in the future, because this has been yeah. awesome. Bill, that would be great, Mark. Your time. Thanks, thanks for guiding me through this. No, you're very, very welcome, sir. Thank you.